my parents, um, they always encouraged us, you know, to take on things that we enjoyed and loved. Um, my dad would take me to El Mirage to see the cars race. Um, I used to go to Riverside Raceway. That's long gone. Um, Ontario. And this was growing up. Um, my aunt lived down the street from John Force. She was a big John Force fan. So as far back as I can remember, I've been going to the races. Welcome to the Owner's Pride Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Williams, Dan E. Williams. And yes, the E stands for Eco Wash. The drought tolerant, eco friendly way to wash your car with just a little bit of water. And you know what? Because who we're talking to today, you probably drive a hot rod if you're listening to this. I have a hot, I have a 41 Chevy. I've never put a hose to that car, not one single time. I only use rinseless wash. There's just no need to. And if you go to ownerspride.com and use code eco wash the world, once again, that's eco wash the world, you'll get 10% off of your whole order. We got all the things to make your car looking shiny at the car show. And speaking of the car show, I have Miss Crafty Kate. Kate, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. Absolutely fantastic. So I, I have to say, um, Crafty Kate, I don't even know if you actually have another full name that goes with that because the only thing I could find <laughs> online was Crafty Kate. Are we just thinking uh, with Crafty Kate or is there something else? Is there a, an alter ego behind this Crafty Kate? Well, actually, Crafty Kate is a name that was given to me because I worked in the film industry for about 32 years doing craft services. So it really has nothing to do with cars, <laughs> but, but it's a nickname and it's stuck. My actual real name is Kate, and my last name is Peroska, which is Hungarian. Okay, there we go. Kate Peroska. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't know. I was thinking, well, maybe she, like, <laughs> also knits quilts <laughs> or or something crazy yep. like that. Um, when I did search your name, a lot of those kind of crafts came up, and I was like, hmm, what does she do? That's interesting. That's interesting. And we're going to dive all into that. On the Owner's Pride podcast, I kind of like to highlight your whole career, where you were, what you've done, and where you're going from here. All right. Okay. Well, as far as cars go, my dad was a mechanic. He oh, made sure well, all slow of Slow down. Slow down. So oh. much like you can't go too darn fast when you're in the grounds at the car show, we're going to take this <laughs> ride nice and slow, and we're going to cruise through this show to highlight you. So here okay. we go. First thing I like to do. And this is a little bit weird, maybe, but that's okay. We're going to jump into the Wayback Machine, and we're going to go back to an earlier time of life. We're going to go all the way back to the first time that you have a memory ever in your life of washing, detailing, touching, doing anything to clean up a car. Let me have it. Um, I probably was 9 or 10. <laughs> My dad was a mechanic, and he was a clean freak. We had to keep everything nice, and we'd take a big old bucket with whatever we had, dish soap, and go out and wash the cars and clean them inside and out. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that's a really common, um, probably 90%, more than 90% of the people say when they first were washing cars, they would just go out there with some dish soap and do it. It's crazy how far the um, car care industry, not only that, but like the paint on cars and the surfaces and everything has come over the years. Yeah. 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 Okay. Tell me about the first car that you had that was your car. Uh, first car car I had um, was a 911 Porsche. <laughs> Holy moly. Okay. Pops was a mechanic and he must have been a pretty darn successful mechanic. Um, tell me about how you got a 911 Porsche. I mean, that's a pretty, that's a, that's going pretty good. Tell me a little bit about this car, where it came from, how you got it, what color it was, and um, the feeling that you had putting the keys in the ignition. I, I was not putting the keys in the ignition of a 911 Porsche on my first car. Uh, well, um, I saved my money modeling, and that was the first actual car I had. So... I just saved all my money. Um, it was a 911. It was beautiful. It was red. 
and I got a little froggy and we pulled the motor and actually put it, a Chevy motor in it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, th I was kind of going to go there next. So growing up with your pops as a mechanic, um, kind of can you tell me what first sparked your interest in the automotive world and, and kind of some of the, how your childhood experiences uh, com contributed to that? I mean, who the heck takes a, a Porsche engine out and puts in a Chevy engine? A crazy person, because <laughs> they sell for a lot of money now. <laughs> uh, my parents... Um, they always encouraged us, you know, to take on things that we enjoyed and loved. Um, my dad would take me to El Mirage to see the cars race. Um, I used to go to Riverside Raceway. That's long gone. Um, Ontario. And this was growing up. Um, my aunt lived down the street from John Force. She was a big John Force fan. So... As far back as I can remember, I've been going to the races. What was the your first memory of ever going to a racetrack, and what kind of races were they? Um, I think the first memory would be on the salt flat because it's such a different experience. It's something that you experience, and it stays with you because you're so excited, all these awesome cars, and then it takes off, and it disappears <laughs> for a long time <laughs> were um i with your dad being a mechanic did he work on race cars and was there other people in your family that race that that really contributed to your love of racing um you know he was a diesel mechanic and he always helped me work on my cars taught us how to work on our cars my dad um he passed away last april and that was one thing at his services that me and my sister were like, we needed to maintain our cars. It was a big thing for him. He wanted us to be independent. Wow, that's very cool. And that's really important stuff to know. Um, you know, if you go to just go to any brand of mechanic, they're and and now they've made the cars like so darn hard to work on with all of the electronic <gasps> stuff. We're talking about cars that were, you know, a, a three a Chevy three fifty engine, right? Yes. Uh, for me, uh, if I can't tune it with a screwdriver, I know nothing about it. I mean, I have friends, you know, like um, Nancy Matter for Nancy Matter Racing and um, Charlotte Smith from Crazy Owl Racing, and they use computers. I, I don't get the drag packs or any of that. I'm straight nostalgia. Well, when you were when you were growing up in school, like in high school, and you know that time of your life, were you participating in any sports or any racing or any modeling at that time? Or if I was to say, you know, ask a crafty Kate before she became crafty Kate, when it was just Kate, hey, what are you going to be when you grow up? From an early age, what would you have said? Oh wow, uh, <laughs> I honestly don't know. Um, my mom instilled in us that to work hard, always work hard, and things will come to you because of your work, not because they're just going to come to you. So, yeah, you know, I don't know that I really had a focus or a plan. I did go to college, and it just wasn't for me. So I became a heavy equipment operator. But all through high school, I did model. I spent every weekend at a different racetrack in a different city, in a different town. I would fly out, be gone for the weekend, be back in time for school, or be back in time for work. Okay, that's that's kind of interesting. So that that was in high school. I was I, from what I was reading. I was thinking that that was afterwards. How did you get into modeling at racetracks? Where did that door open for you? Where did you see the opportunity? So I was Miss Harupa, which is a small like suburb in Riverside County. And um, a really good friend of mine was connected to Dave Russell from Russell Performance. And I started doing... Um, like SEMA shows, promo girl stuff. And that's where it really took off from. So then was that like a paid gig? You were getting paid? Obviously you're traveling around. How did that work out? 
Yeah. Um, I think my first paying model job was probably maybe I was 16. I'm guessing 16. Um, I was super tall. I was just under five foot ten, and you know, tall, skinny blonde. I was the you know image of California, <laughs> so it just seemed to work. Uh, my mom wasn't real thrilled about it because when at one point in my life um, she, they worked in the garment industry, and my mom was really really concerned about me going to some third world country and being kidnapped. <laughs> I'm fairly realistic concern to have. That's for yeah. sure. So, what what did you learn out of modeling? Like, what kind of stuff would you do? Would you just go stand beside the cars? Were you were you selling items? Or I, I'm just trying to really wrap my head around what that entailed. Okay. Um, so, depend on what the circumstances were. Um, you were giving out uh, posters. You signed posters taking pictures with people. Uh, some of it was actually, you know, showing the product to people. Uh, yeah, standing on cars, laying on cars, in cars, over cars. <laughs> yeah, I've done it all. <laughs> but um, it, it just depends on what it was. When I was at the drag strip, I was what they call a bug, which is a backup girl. So when the car does its burnout, I'm sure you already know this, but when the car does its burnout and puts the car in neutral, you back the car up. Um, there's some things that transpire. I can't give you names, but I can tell you sometimes way back way, <laughs> they would pull a spark plug. So the car did a really bad burnout, sounded like it was missing, and my job was to back the car up go up and check it and put the park plug wire back on. And then they would run like crazy. And when they first got there, it sounded bad. So it's kind of a trick. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of sandbag and I like it. I like it. <laughs> no um, my names. wife and my wife was um did some backup girls here in San Diego uh stuff with nice. one of our friends who had a gremlin that he was racing. Um what kind of what kind of the cars were these? Uh, like um, your run what you brung guys, or was this like bigger, more professional racing? Um, bigger, more professional racing. Um, sometimes you just get hired. Like if you've ever been to um, the Winter Nationals, the promo girls are all out front uh, giving out samples of like soda and things like that. Um, when I would be with a team, it was a little different. Like, um, I, I don't know if you know who George the Bushmaster is. Mm -hmm. um, I probably drove them nuts when I was with them um, in Florida because I genuinely love cars. So Schreiber <laughs> would be like, where'd she go? I'd be in the semi asking, well, why are you doing that to the motor? Why are you doing this to the motor? I drove them nuts because I really genuinely loved cars. And, you know, the way I got there was because I looked good in a swimsuit and four inch heels and towered over everybody. And, you know, it's good for business. <laughs> but I really would drive them nuts about stuff. I would ask them about things, you know, just <laughs> all the time. And they'd be like, get out of here. Well, they were busier, but I don't know that. I think that sounds like a pretty darn attractive feature for a woman to have to me. And I yeah. say that but funny because I'm very not mechanical myself, to be quite honest. But um, <laughs> well, so what were some of the challenges and highlights of working as a spokesmodel and doing backup girl stuff um, in, in, in the automotive industry like that? Um, you know, Linda Vaughn once told me when we were at SEMA, enjoy the ride but don't hook up with a ride. <laughs> and I think that was the biggest challenge for me um, because people just assume, you know, oh, you're this tall, beautiful blonde and you're half naked. So, you know, it's, it's an easy catch, but it wasn't. I took that to heart and knew that I was there to do a job, tried to be as professional as I could and 
saved every penny I made. Well, and you bought a darn Porsche with it. So, uh, you know, and, and you're absolutely right. It's probably even quicker of a path to get a bad reputation or, you know, kind of a soiled reputation than yeah. it is to build up a really great reputation of being great at what you do for the right reasons. So it's been yeah. awesome that you stayed on that path. Well, you, So you've worked with notable names and you mentioned like George the Bushmaster and you've been involved with Christine Promod. Um, can you share some kind of insider stories from uh, some of your times working with some of those people? <laughs> um, I can tell you the original Christine Promod. We're not talking about the current one. Um, the original one actually burned up, I think it was 90 or 91, in a trailer fire. I don't know if you know that, but um, they were very... Richard Earl was probably one of the most professional people I ever dealt with. Um, it was important that everything was covered, uh, proper, but still sexy. Um, and I don't know that a lot of people know that. Um, they treated me with respect. I, I felt like I was comfortable around everyone there. And then when, um, in Florida, when we met up with George, they're a great family. Eric is George's son. Um, Shanna is his wife. They were, it was like just waking up one day and you're with a family. They treated me really, really well. Um, still to this day, when I see them, they're, they're just amazing people. So like, I can't really tell you secrets about anything. I mean, I have funny stories, but they're secondary honey, funny stories from other people. <laughs> so, you know, I want to share fair those. Enough. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. You know, uh, when I interview people like you who are some celebrity status and you've been in that world, that's one of my favorite things, though, is to get some of those insider yeah. stories. Um, so if you, if when we're talking, if you're like, I do have one that I want to tell you, feel free to interrupt me at any time and we'll take that on. <laughs> So, so how did your role evolve from being in front of the camera to becoming a key promoter for car shows and races? So, let's see. In 1989, I broke my neck. And um, I moved to the desert in 90. And I have been, best description is um, helping with promotions for Rods West, which currently is trying to retire. Don will be 77 this year. Um, they've been building Anglias, Austins, Fiat's, uh, mostly Willys, shipped them all over the world, trying to get the shop down. At one time, they had like over 2,000 um, American racing wheels. Um, we've sold most of them off. He's trying to retire. I spent all my time, um, well, I modeled for them a lot. You'll see a lot of that stuff, like me laying on wheels. <laughs> but I spent a lot of time in the shop learning about a lot of stuff that I didn't understand. Because I was always, you know, like I said, I have to have a screwdriver to adjust the carburetor. I don't, I'm not into any of the modern stuff at all. So I spent a lot of time with Don and, um, have learned a lot of things that I didn't quite understand. Just little little things, but they were important things, you know. So um, speaking of Rods West, can you tell me about a project or something that you worked on from there that was really kind of stands out for you? Um, I, I don't know if you know what the Silly Willy is, but the Silly Willy was um, a winter national winner in 1961 and it's a four-door sedan and has a 409 in it and Don got it from the Lions Museum from Brick in a deal and it was just a body and there's a lot of documentation about the car I that car is like my favorite car in the whole entire world I really want the car um, they resurrected it. They built it. It was in Hot Rod Magazine and several others, you know, Jalopy Journals, all kinds of stuff. 
he rebuilt the car and um, I would take the car to car shows and of course, clean it, wash it, make it pretty. <laughs> I scrubbed a lot of wheels in my days. <laughs> you and, and me um, both, sister. You and me both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. That's my favorite car ever. Um, it. The shop sold the car. The new owner doesn't have time um, for the car, and it's still at Rod's West. And we still take it to a lot of events and stuff. Um, it's just that car knowing it was just a body. There wasn't even a ch chassis. And watching it evolve into what it is today, looking just like it did back then, contacting the people. For Don, it's really important, the history. So him contacting everyone that was involved in the car, Bob Stahl, um, Jack Gannon, he did all the history and research and found out, oh, I'm trying to remember what the name was. Um, it was something orange before it was Silly Willy, but it it's just one of those cars, my heart and soul's in it. Can you tell me a little bit, like a little bit of the details about it? Like what kind of a body is it and what kind of motor did it have in it? And and maybe some of the times that that thing bursted down the track. So it raced up until the seventies. We don't know how the museum ended up with the body on a pallet, but um, we do a lot of work with Lions um, Museum because we have a lot of Willie's parts. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting relationship. They need something, we need something kind of thing. So Don ended up with just the body and it's a 1941 Willie's four-door sedan and it was, that's it, nothing else. And so through following all the trails, all the information, contacting all the people who owned it, um, we've met people who's you know, um, Jack Gannon's family came to Viva Las Vegas and wanted to take pictures with the car. Um, it, it's got a lot of history and a lot of people know the car. So it's, it's kind of part of a generation that's gone. Okay. So it sounds like a lot of uh, you, you've mentioned Willie's on here multiple times and those and I know that you guys do a lot of gassers, right? So what yes, I have a 41 Chevy special deluxe coupe and it's a two door. And th so they're all kind of a similar body style. What is it about that Willie's that just makes it the quintessential car of that era to be a gasser? Um, in my opinion, it's going to be the fact that you can take it doesn't weigh much, but you can take more weight out of it and make it just, uh, they're amazing. I, the two doors, everybody loves the two doors. I, I'm partial to the four door. I like four doors. Um, it has this look about it. And just like your car has that grill and the grill like makes it look, I don't know, aggressive <laughs> is the word, but they just look amazing. They're beautiful. They were, you know, you can just modify them to make them anything you want, but they make a beautiful gasser. Yeah, they really do. They really, I, like I said, I think yeah. that is the quintessential car to get made into a gasser. It's just, I think they're supposed to be like that. And that grill on the front of those, that thin, arr, it does look, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So let's kind of flip yeah. over to promoting some of these car shows. And you've had some really important ones like the Centennial Birthday Car Shows. And, and these are a significant responsibility. So in promoting Ed Iskadari and Centennial Car Shows and some of these really big car shows, it's a really significant responsibility. How do you approach organizing such monumental events? I, I can't even imagine the work that goes into this. You know, for me, um, Ed Iskadarian is a it's like a love for me. Um, I've known Ed since I was a teenager doing promo stuff, um, going to SEMA. He's, I swear he's been old all of my life. He's the kindest, most gentle human being. 
He's so business minded. It's insane how smart he is. So for me, it's easy. I can get people to get involved. I can get companies to want to participate. It's probably one of the easiest things to produce or pull off because people love Ed and people come. Um, the hundredth was crazy in the desert and um, Rod's West has participated in Ed's birthdays for 16 years. When his 99th birthday came around, um, the people who put off his birthday contacted me and asked if I would help them promote it. And I said, sure, I'll do it. Um, the hundredth that it was just, it was insane. There was a lot of people. Um, the 101th birthday, not quite as crazy. Um, the last one, which we held at Lions Museum, was probably by far my favorite because um, it's centrally located. It was easy for everyone in LA to come. Everything, we were volunteers. We didn't get paid. We don't get paid to do this. Um, we do it out of the kindness of our heart. Every penny that's made is donated. And that's how Ed works. Ed's not, you know, oh, let's sell this and make money. You know, he's a genuine, kind person. So all the money that's made goes to kids. So the Lions Museum Foundation, um, Lions Automobilia, has a group of kids they work with. They teach them about cars and how to build motors, and they're part of some great programs, and that's where all the money goes, is to, get, is to kids. No, and that's incredibly awesome, incredibly awesome. Yeah. And and so I know you said you have to kind of go and, and help get sponsors and stuff like that for people, but what all goes into planning a, a big, successful car show, and how do you measure if it was successful or not? Um, you try to get key people to help you. Like you have to have five or six people that are willing to give everything, all their time, energy, and effort, um, the day of the show. So everything that's done before the show, I pretty much run a one man crew. I do all the contacts. I make sure all the sponsorship stuff is handled. All, all of the entry stuff. Um, working with Lions, it was really nice because everything went through them. So I didn't have to create any of the artwork or anything. Their people did it. Um, I just had to share a link for people to go to to buy tickets to the event or to participate in the event. And it was a great Mary for me because like the car show I'm working on right now, it's a lot. <laughs> Uh, and actually, that's exactly where I was going next. Your fundraiser for the Ridgecrest Animal Shelter um, is really commendable. And it has a special place in my heart because all my dogs are rescues, too. But how did that initiative start and what kind of effect has it had on the community? Well, OK, so <clears throat> um, I don't know how familiar you are with L.A. I don't know if you've ever heard of Performance Plus. So... Performance Plus does this thing every year at Christmas, and they do a parade, and um, it, it's a big event for them. Uh, they have Santa Claus. They give unfortunate kids all kinds of stuff, and it's in Long Beach, and they have this cool roadster. So the roadster was in the shop at Rod's West because it was having some issues, transmission, and the Kernville Rod Run had come up. And we had asked if we could take the car. So we're driving along and we stopped at the gas station and across the gas station is Classic Burger, which my friend owns. And um, I was like, hey, pull the car up over there. I'll take a picture. So he pulls up over there and we get some pictures. And I'm like, this is pretty cool. And I sent him to the owner, Abdul, and we went about our merry way. And he was like, man, we need to do a car show. I'm like, okay, this is October, by the way. We need to do a car show. I'm like, okay, maybe we could pull something off. So I had gone to the local school asking them if they would like the money for books or backpacks or something. Because in Inyo Kern, 
it's a very small community outside of Ridgecrest, which is a large community. And I kind of thought they would want to, but it was a lot of red tape for them and they were not interested. And the only way I would do the car show is if I could do it nonprofit, do it to give the money away. I wouldn't do the car show to make money. And it, it's not that I feel like people who make money at car show should make money at all. That's not what I'm saying. That's just, I wanted to do something for the community, make it about that community. Yeah. Did that strategy of, of turning into um, a charitable organization, did that make it easier for you to go and get people to be sponsors? Um, yes and no. Uh, everything is evolving right now. Ever since COVID, things have changed. Um, a lot of the big companies that used to send us stuff, and, I, and I'm not saying like sending us money or making a big deal out of something. I'm talking like simple things like stickers and stuff like that. A lot of the companies have backed out and it, it's a little, it's making it a little difficult. So, you know, when you have a small community and you have a larger community outside of it, you have to rely on a lot of people there to do stuff. Um, it gets, it gets expensive and we don't want to spend money, you know, like, we buy the t-shirts and then, you know, have to pay that money back before we can donate the money because it's like, you know, thousands of dollars, but you know, everything's just, it's crazy. The state charges us, even as a nonprofit, they charge us $486 for a permit for one day. Eesh, eesh. Well, can you tell a story about a time that the car community came together for one of these causes that was really, really meaningful to you? Um, you know, my car show was scheduled to be on March 19th, three days before that. And this was 2020. The county contacted me and said, you can't, you can't do the car show. I was... <laughs> devastated. It was horrible. I, I was crying. I couldn't stop crying. I was calling everybody, trying to get advice. If I had done the car show, I would have been blackballed by the county. I would never have gotten a permit again. It was horrible. And every, I was calling people, emailing people, calling people to call people. I am like desperate to, you know, make contact with people. And it was really hard. Um, on that Saturday, um, I went to Classic Burger and um, my family, because my whole family was there, and we all went there to have lunch. And the place was packed. Like, everybody came. They knew that they were expecting to have this big event. And they all came to have lunch and try to support the people who supported us. Awesome. That's how did that make you feel? Like when you saw all of the people there that kind of came out anyway? It, it was pretty awesome. One of the local car clubs in Ridgecrest called Going Solo. They all showed up. All their cars were parked in the parking lot. It was wonderful. So cool. So cool. Well, let's go back a little bit now. And um, you mentioned in 1989 that you were in an accident and, and broke your neck. Was that, were yes. you racing in that or was that just a regular car? Tell me a little bit about what that experience was and kind of how it changed your, your life. <laughs> because that's a big life changer. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, I wasn't racing. I was, um, I, I have to be careful what I say because there actually is a gag order. Um, I was on a piece of equipment. It was green. <laughs> and it was a brand new technology. And um, I was hired to actually show it off. And something happened in the PTO on that. And I had, I'm trying to think of the words without <laughs> getting in trouble. Um, I had some difficulties and one whole side of the unit failed and it rolled. The problem was it rolled and I rolled downhill um, 180 feet. Holy moly. Uh, yeah. Hold. Yeah. Uh, okay. No. I so don't suggest I, I, you do that. <laughs> no. I and and I'll try and we'll try to, you know, skirt around. 
and and avoid the technical details yeah. that would be troublesome. Yeah. But first of all, as that thing starts to roll, what does Kate think? And 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 as it's not as fast as a car wrecking on a racetrack that actually had to roll down 180 feet. So what did you think as that thing is going down? Um, when it first rolled, I wasn't too concerned about it. When I realized I was rolling again, I pulled the belt. I jumped. Um, if I hadn't jumped, I wouldn't have survived it. <laughs> wow. Wow. What, yeah. So going through an experience like that, how did that change the outlook of your life? And because you hear so many times people that have a near-death experience and, and it really alters their life. A, a lot of times that alters their life for a very short period of time. Like my sister had breast cancer and right after she was done with breast cancer and treatment, she quit smoking and then she started smoking cigarettes again directly after. So oh. so kind of how <laughs> how did that change your life and did that have a lasting impact? So... Um, I remember being in the hospital and being on my stomach with my face down and someone talking to me and telling me, um, we're doing a spinal tap. You have to hold still, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, what just happened? Apparently I was talking to them. I didn't know what had happened prior to that. It was like, they thought I was fully conscious and aware of what was going on and I wasn't but I was talking to him and it, it was very scary when they told me that um I had what's called a stabilized fracture where the centers of the discs were punched out in C3, 5 and 6 and 3 is your breathing which was scary I'm like okay I'm scared you know what's gonna happen and it was great until they shaved my head. Well, the bottom half of it. I, I was a little freaked out over that. <laughs> I'm like, my hair. <laughs> I can kind of understand that one. <laughs> uh, well, as a woman, you know, we're in a little vain sometimes. <laughs> so it, I, I would imagine that might be kind of where you shifted your 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 career path and got into the film industry. Can you tell me a little bit how yeah, that opportunity was... opened up? Okay. <laughs> so, um, I had dabbled in the film, film industry here and there through the years. Um, I've been on a few films and done some walk on work and stuff like that. Um, I was hired as a stand in, for Amy Bremerman. And apparently Amy Bremerman had lied about how tall she was. So when they hired me, I got there and I was way taller than her. It wasn't gonna work, but they decided to keep me. They were like, okay, you know, you you got a great personality, you're a great person. You know what, we'll keep you the whole entire film. We'll find things for you to do. I did all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and they were like, hey, we're going to have to do some secondary stuff. Do you think you could cover the craft services? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I've been around it enough. So I started helping out and it, it was like my phone started ringing and wouldn't stop ringing. I was always busy. People wanted me to do craft services. I did some catering. Um, catering's a lot more labor intensive, but I did it. Um, I hooked up with Stargate Digital and did hundreds of commercials. Um, lots of Desmond Spot kind of stuff, um, luxury cars. And of course, you know, I'm over there. Hi, would you like a snack? What kind of motors it got in it? <laughs> How fast does it go? <laughs> well, it, it seems like it just fell right back into what your passion play was, which was automotive. Now, yeah. <laughs> so where did, who gave you the name Crafty Kate? Okay, um, craft services is a unionized industry in the film industry. I, it's part of the Grips Union, um, and it's called craft services. Some people, they call them crafties, and, you know, so people 
get their business name from the word crafty. Well, my name's Kate, so Crafty Kate. <laughs> it fit. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Now, do you you've raced cars yourself? I believe, and of course, I would yes. imagine if I could venture a guess, I probably already know what kind of car that you have to race. But um, tell me a little bit about your how you got into racing yourself from being a model and from and from being on the other side and being at the tracks. What was the first car that you had? And tell me a little bit about the very first race that was an actual race. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess since both my parents are gone, I can tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, Riverside Speedway, which is long gone, You there, I think it was Thursday night, might have been Wednesday, um, run what you brung, I had a Porsche, <laughs> now you know why it ended up with a Chevy motor in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. I, mostly door cars. Um, you know, I mostly did exhibition stuff. I, I not I'm not that person who strives to win or break a record or anything. I love the experience. I love fuel. I love the smell, the sound. I yeah, I'm just addicted. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Well, yeah. So when you're out there to describe what it's like, so a lot of people maybe have not ever drag raced before. And it seems that's really where your specialty lies is in the drag race community. Mm -hmm. So you do your burnout and you come up to the light and you wait for it. Tell me about that minute that you're sitting in the car from your burnout to until they launch you. Um, you know, I don't remember who told me this, um, but it was out at Riverside and they always said, don't wait for the light to turn green. Take your chance. Get a red light. Who cares? You're not racing for big money or anything. So I was, I, I did red light a lot when I was younger. <laughs> because, I, yeah, the yellow light, it was like go time, you know. Um, the fastest I've ever been is under 140 miles an hour. <laughs> I wasn't the fastest, but... When you're sitting there and you're you're excited and watching that light and waiting for it to move, that first move, it's almost like you're vibrating. You're just waiting to pop the clutch, stab the gas, and hope it goes straight. Especially if it's a gasser, because you know you pop the you pop the clutch, you're looking at the sky. So fun, so fun. What? So for you, what do you feel the difference? Like you still go to the tracks. You have a car currently, right? But it's but it's under construction right now. Um. Yeah, I have a car. It's in pieces. <laughs> and are you are you uh, building that yourself, or is it at the rod shop or rod? No, West? no, no. I was building it myself um, with help from um, like Lions Museum. Um, they have a shop connected to them that's ran by them um and uh i had like headers built things like that um larry wagner helped me um you know do the front end and stuff like that in the middle of building the car um i i ended up going into the emergency room i was doing laundry believe it or not um i ended up going to the emergency room and finding out that disc number seven in my neck is blown out um i was scheduled to have surgery during covid the doctor said it's considered elective it's not life-threatening um, because of covid we're not going to do it so even if i wanted to race i can't i can't pass a physical because of it um so you know my hopes and dreams were get through all this covid stuff get to the other end get surgery and you know I, I also have a magnum wagon I was thinking about making a door car out of it you know get to the other side go racing but I got bad news in October of this year um, I have with uh, advanced stage osteoporosis can't even say it um, so I have fractures in my hips and my lower back and I just started treatment in January so I'm on a treatment. I have to give myself a shot every day for the next two years and see what happens. 
Yeah, sorry to hear that. I did. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> This whole this whole putting a couple of years on us is not, not anything really getting old ain't for sissies. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so now I look. I've been checking out a lot of your social media, and you know I, I'm 55 years old, and so in similar in age. And when we were starting all of our stuff, there was none. Of, there was no cell phones. There was no Facebook. There was you know no Instagram. How how do you see the the landscape of all of that side of your life change, and how did you start rolling into doing social media? Uh, you know, I, I didn't take social media too seriously at first. <laughs> um, I I just figured, oh, it's a great place, you know, to share with people who aren't close, and you know, because like a lot of my friends, you know, live in Texas or. Or um, like uh, Teresa um, and Phil, they they race dirt, and they're out of um, Joplin, Missouri. It's easy to keep in contact with each other and share stuff. It was convenient, and because we all live in different time zones, it was just I, I didn't take it seriously at all. Um, in twenty twenty one. We had a death in the family, and um, I had said on Facebook that I was going to California, or to Nevada, um, it was one of our sisters, and um, that I wouldn't be available. I had 60,000 followers, and I had been having a small problem with someone um, saying I wasn't real, I was a man pretending to be a woman, and Facebook took me down. And I didn't really realize how much of a reach you had with the Facebook. And I was mad, so I was like, I ain't doing it. <laughs> then I decided, all right, because so many people are like, hey, where are you? You know? So I started back up. And um, actually this week, I'm back to 10,000 followers as Crafty Kate. Um, I just took other steps. I became verified, so I'm verified in my whole f real name, which is Catherine G. Peraska. Um, and I have a little more protection. I get customer service, believe it or not. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so what kind of a... So you had you lost everything of 60,000 yes. followers and then had to start from ground zero? Yep. What was what's the strategy that you have to build yourself back up? Um, what kind of what works best videos or pictures or or tell me the strategy that you use to build it back up? Because it sounds like you're killing it. I want ten thousand followers. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm genuine. I'm myself. You know, um, half naked pictures help. <laughs> I don't share them, but sometimes when someone else shares them, you know, I'll share them or somebody will tag me in them or something. But, you know, I try to be genuine. I try to be upfront. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just me. I'm a real person. I like to do things that help the community. I like to do things like raise money for the animal shelter. Um, I try to get my friends involved. I get my friends involved. <laughs> That's where Hot Rod Holly comes in. <laughs> you get Hot Rod Holly to come to your car show, and everybody's coming. <laughs> right, right. I, I'm when I first, very first, got my hot rod. Um, I met her right away at a car show, and and we like to go on the cruises that she puts on. So she puts on cruises every once in a while, and we'll all meet up somewhere, and there'll be anywhere from 20 to 50 cars, and everybody kind of takes yep. the same path, and then we'll stop along the way and, and hang out, and then go somewhere and get food, usually. Um, do yeah. you guys do uh, cruises also, and what do you feel about the your liking of the cruises versus the car shows? Um, I don't personally do the cruises. Um, so the car show, it's a community event. Um, we have everybody involved. So the local, I call them kids. I, I'm 56, so I call them kids. Some of them may be 40. <laughs> I don't know, but they're still all kids to me. Mm -hmm. um, 
they have their local car club and I try to share everything um, for the going solo, um, the Misfits car club, Muscle Mustangs, the Ridge Crest, and they support me because I'm really old school, so I don't understand the new cars. I don't, you know? It's like Kelly Barr Anderson. Oh my gosh, I love her. She's great. She's a drag racer out of Irwindale. I looked at that car and said, why is the dash digital? <laughs> She's like, uh, it's a computer. <laughs> you know, but getting all these people to help and be involved and participate. Um, to me, that's important because that's who I am. I'm just a regular person like everybody else. Yeah. I mean, I had a colorful past. I did a lot of fun stuff and my friends are amazing. You know, I mean, who can, who can not say, oh yeah, Bob Beck, Johnny Martinez. I, you know, I got Roger Nitty. I got all these people, you know, uh, coming to my car show to help me, you know, and Ian from full custom garage, him and his wife, their, their dogs come from shelters, you know? I, so it's great. It's great to be a part of it. And I always say it's our car show. Because it is, it's everybody's. So one of the things that I always notice, whether it's on television or I go to the, the local track here at Barona where they're um, having drag races, they don't seem to have very big of a draw. And, and I, I really don't know why that is. It seems like it would be hard to bring sponsors in for that stuff. But why do you think that it has such a low draw when it's so darn cool to watch? You know, I, it depends on the track. I mean, a lot of people can't go to NHRA events because they're expensive. Let's be honest. Um, a $10 cheeseburger, a $7 soda. It's just, it just doesn't make sense to take your family. Um, like Morano and Irwindale, they do, there's, I mean, Irwindale has a lot of people going and they're opening to other things see the younger people are into drifting i i didn't get the drifting at all and lana chrisman from uh Wyans museum was like kate it's a talent don't you know and i was like I, I just don't get it you know but once i opened my mind to it and started watching it and finding out charlotte's son his name is Ray's, he does it and i started realizing that making events for these younger people that have different interests, you know what I mean? Um, me growing up and like, you know, the people I work with and for like Dawn and, and Ed, I, they were the groundbreakers, you know, they grew up inventing things, making things, uh, they were the ones that made it what it is today. And it, unless you're following something like the Heritage Series or, you know, any group like that, it's all modern. Everything has gone modern. Um, so you, you have to find that balance. Um, and I think a lot of it is promoting. If you're not promoting it, every time I come across a small track or see someone post something from a track, I share it. I, I, I share Irwindale all the time. Um, I share when tests and tunes are happening out at um, uh, Famoso. And, because it, it's just getting the word out to people. Once you go to a race, you're addicted. I mean, I'm addicted. <laughs> So you mentioned like that the younger people are into drifting now and, the, and we have the, you know, drag racing and oval mm -hmm. racing and, mm -hmm. and hairpin turn racing. Where do you think that racing is going to in the future? What's the next shoe to drop that's going to be the new thing that maybe people don't even see coming yet? You know, um, I, every time I go to the track, the young people are there with their modern cars and I, I get it, you know, you have a good job, you can afford to buy a new car, and you know, 
I want to see put a hair dryer on it, but that's not appropriate. You want to put a turbo on it or, you know what I mean? That's their thing. I don't, I just don't understand it because for me, it's like, oh, look, there's a body. Let's build a chassis. Let's put it together. Let's build a motor from the ground up. Let's call, you know, someone and say, hey, you know, you got any time left on the dyno? You know, you call in LTR and say, can I put this on your dyno and see if it's even going to work or blow up or whatever, you know, because I put junk in it or, you know, um, I, the kids are becoming, I guess, more professional and there's not as many of them interested in spending the time to build the cars. So I kind of see a lot of it becoming modern. But there are still going to be and always will be a percentage of people who are going to be the way we are. You know, um, I can't, I, I always say you can't see past Daniel Kern Road. Uh, um, I, I don't, I don't understand what they do, but I encourage it yeah. because it's cars. So, okay. So lastly. Since we talked about the younger people who are coming in, what kind of advice would you give to young auto enthusiasts who are starting to come into their own and shape their own auto enthusiast world? You know, um, <clears throat> find someone older and learn. Learn things that you can do that aren't in the book. There's a lot of stuff. There's little things, little secrets and stuff that you can do to make your car faster. I mean, everybody knows, take weight off, it's going to go faster. Well, if you drive your car every day to work and you're going to race it, you probably don't want to take the weight off of it, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, it could be dangerous. But there, find someone older to make that connection with. Um, go to the races. People... In general, at the races, you show up and you offer to help. They'll welcome you, you know, and especially if you're young and you want to learn something. They'll open their arms and be like, come on down, hang out, learn, you know, learn what you can learn. But if your goal is just to be into the new cars and you don't want to learn about the old technology or you don't want to run FED or you don't want to run an altered or a true funny car, you know, and we're not talking about, uh, 340 mile an hour cars, but they're fast. They're insane. The motors in front of you, it, it's a whole different world. It's a different feeling. Yeah. So cool. So cool. Well, th if somebody wants to find out more about you and what you're doing and even sponsor or, um, contribute in some way to the, especially for this animal charity that you have going up. Um, how do they find more, more about Kate? Um, well, you can follow me on Facebook at crafty Kate and, um, my web page is getting a little work done to it, but it is crafty Kate's with an S dot com. Um, you can message me. My phone number is very public. It's in a PSA. And it's 760-413-1559. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, if you ever make it down to San Diego, my 41 Chevy ain't going that far for any car show because um, I don't think they make yeah. gas clo gas stations close enough together to keep that 10-gallon <laughs> fuel cell filled. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm a local. That's great. <laughs> but if you ever come down here, I would love to run into you to show. And thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to share some of your stories and experience on the Owner's Pride podcast. Thank you. It, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to hang out with us here on the Owner's Pride Podcast. If you found value in what we were putting out, please take a moment and hit the like and subscribe button. If you're more interested in listening to it instead of watching, then we're available everywhere for audio podcast. And if you use code ECOWASHTHEWORLD at checkout on ownerspride.com, you're going to get 10% off of your order. Again, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to hang out with us here. Without you, it would just be me talking to myself. Until next time, stay glossy.